help us to organize this event. Jane Garrity, Teresa Nugent, Grant Savers, and our own Kat Lewis. <laughs> Thank you, Kat. Um, I'll just go ahead and get started and introduce our speaker today. Olivia Henderson Mitchell graduated from CU with an MA in English and a graduate certificate in Women's and Gender Studies in 2017. With her sister, history professor Katie Nelson, she's the producer and co-host of What's Her Name? Women's History podcast, which launched in 2018 and has been downloaded over 100,000 times and in over 100 countries in the past year. And last month it was ranked in iTunes' Top 25 History Podcast. <laughs> um, committed to reclaiming forgotten history, What's Her Name tells the stories of fascinating women you've never heard of but should have. Through compelling interviews with acclaimed guest historians, writers, and scholars, Katie and Olivia put the women back in the story. Olivia is also an adjunct instructor of Women's and Gender Studies and English at Nairobi University and University of Denver, and the creator of Around the World in 80 Diapers, a travel website empowering parents to travel internationally with their kids. She previously worked for many years as a librarian, a freelance writer, and a college writing instructor. Um, so I would like to uh, offer a warm welcome to Olivia. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. This is fun to be back in here. I haven't been back in this building in a year. It was kind of weird to see my picture on the wall, but it's cool. <laughs> um, so, as she said, I'm the host and the producer of the What's Her Name Women's History podcast. Um, and a little bit, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about that, about how it started, about what it is, about how we do it. But mostly what I want to talk about is how you can do the stuff you want to do. Um, that may be a podcast or maybe some other creative project or maybe something that doesn't exist yet that you will decide you want to invent um, and launch into the world because I think um, English really is the best launching ground for amazing innovative new stuff and so I want to make sure that you understand like the possibilities of that but also how you can strategically position yourself to be able to do the stuff that you want to do. So, um, in 2017, I was walking through the Columbia Cemetery up on the hill, as one does, and I do. I've been informed that people don't. They think it's weird that I wander around the cemetery. Um, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. I was about to graduate with my master's here. I had been rejected by the only PhD program that I applied to, <coughs> and I wasn't sure what my trajectory was going to look like. I had been working as a freelance writer for many years, I know I could still do that, but it felt really depressing to sort of just keep doing the same job that I had had after doing another degree. Um, so my sister Katie is a history professor, and she and I have been talking about ways that we could get more women's history out into the world. It was really important to us that that women are treated like they mattered in the past and like they did things because they did. Spoilers! Women have done things all the time. Uh, and that the idea that they're just completely left out of someone's art history was totally unacceptable to us. So we talked about different options, writing articles or doing walking tours or all kinds of different things that we could think of. Um, one of the suggestions was to do a women's history podcast. Uh, she suggested that we should do a podcast about all the women that no one has ever heard of. The, the historical women who you should know them, but they got erased. I frankly thought that this was a terrible idea. Women's history is hard enough already. It's really hard to get people on board with caring about this. Why would we choose to make it harder? Why would we choose to try to do a podcast about people no one cared about? But I kind of humored it, fine. Yeah, I mean, we can think about that. And as I was walking through this graveyard, this grave stopped me in my tracks. Uh, I was completely horrified by this. I'm a mother. I have three kids who I love a lot. I am not mother. I'm me. And the complete erasure of this woman really bothered me. I, on my way back to campus, after walking through this, I called Katie on the phone and I said, okay, we're doing it. We're doing that right now. 
it's not optional anymore. And uh, she was a little surprised, but excited that I was on board and what to name was born. So, what do we do? Oh. Um, so, what to name is a women's history podcast that is each episode is centered on a different woman from history that you've never heard of, but you should have. And each episode has an interview with a scholar or historian, an expert, a writer, someone who is an expert on this person that we're talking about. Um, the only rules that we have are that the person has to be dead and they can't be famous. That's it. And they have to have existed, which is oh, something that has come up since then. It can't be a non-existent character. Um, which kind of narrows it down in weird ways. So, just to give you an idea, I'm assuming that probably most people in this room haven't heard it. Here's our little trailer, just so you know. Maybe she is the great champion of history's bedraggled losers. <laughs> But he completely made up her life. I think it was the first book that I read that had a female protagonist who did stuff instead of just having feelings. She was brave and she bossed the boys around. Despite the reports that she disliked watching her husband perform the bullet catch, she stood in front of a firing squad catching six bullets fired at her by the local militia. A man to visit this house had to give an application. They wouldn't let Riff Raff in this house. There, there was a literal application? Oh, yes. I had to write a letter of application. She'd always been this luminous figure in Maori context. Somebody that you, you couldn't look beyond, you couldn't undermine, you couldn't ignore. She was pressed to death with her own front door. We have some wonderful accounts while the Pope Protestant minister was trying to give his sermon that uh, Catholics would be firing guns into the roof of the church. She had the most revolutionary idea of all, and that was the people can't come or won't come to the library. Let's take the library to the people. She loved to study yodeling in Switzerland. This woman, there was nothing she didn't do. I'm Olivia Mickle, and I'm Katie Nelson, and this is Watson. Fascinating women you've never heard of. So that's sort of what it's like. Um, those are a bunch of clips from a bunch of different episodes. But essentially, we just ask our guest who they want to talk about, and that's who we talk about. Um, we're not curating, we're not picking, we're not... Occasionally, we will say, I'd really love to talk about this person, I'm going to try to find someone who can talk about this person. But generally, we're just leaving it up to the guest, because we've discovered that people are really entertaining and really interesting when they're interested. And so sometimes guests will be like, oh, I probably should talk about this person because she's more important, but this one is more interesting. So do who you want to talk about. That's the whole point. We want you to be excited. And they're very excited to get to talk about people they've never gotten to talk about before. Um, so in the beginning, we, we sought people out. When we launched this, we had to go out and find people who were willing to talk to us. Now we are big enough that people are coming to us, which is a great position to be in and weird, that we're having to say no to like important people who want to be on our podcast, which is alarming, but um, we're also really committed to diversity on the, of representation, meaning region of the world, race, time period, all of those things have to come into play, and, and frankly we end up with way too many white American ladies. Um, and so having to say no to some of those even really fascinating people is really agonizing but it means that we get better stories out there and stories that no one's ever talked about before. Um, if anyone listens to Radiolab, it's kind of that similar format. So it's a interview and a report. So Katie or I will do an interview and then we will um, edit that interview, intercut with conversations between Katie and I talking about the interview, talking about the person, filling in contact, things like that. Um, it's, that's partially because of logistics. She lives in Utah and I live here, so we can't do interviews together, um, and it's partially because having guests means that we don't have to do as much research. If anyone here has a podcast, I'm assuming a lot of you do, it seems like a third of my students have a podcast, which is awesome, um, you know that the research is 
just ridiculous if you're doing a research-based podcast. This means that we don't have to be the expert because they're the expert. We just have to know enough to ask smart questions. And so that makes it a lot easier, even though it means, make, means that that's getting so much worse, which we didn't realize. Um, and another reason we use this format is because of something that I'm going to talk about a little later in this talk. But when we started, we decided, okay, if 50 people listen to this consistently, once we've really built up an audience and we've really launched and we're doing really well, if 50 people are consistently listening, it'll be worth it and we'll keep doing it. Because that we thought that it would take about the same amount of hours as prepping two classes and that's about the same amount. We were way off on how long it takes. It takes much longer than prepping two classes. But that's what we thought. And so our bar was 50 people that we would continue to do it. And as she just said, we just hit, um, my husband just texted me this morning, 113,000 downloads. And last month we were number 23 on iTunes history and we were in the top 1,000 podcasts, period, in the country. Now, just for some context, <laughs> for some context, there are 750,000 active podcasts in the U.S. right now. So that was, I, I kept checking, I was like, no, nah, wait, no, in Colorado, in history, you know, period. So we're still doing it, apparently. Um, we launched on January 1st, 2018, and we have covered some really, really amazing women um, in those 18 months. So I'm just going to introduce you to a few of them that I just love because I think they're fantastic. Noor Jahan, she was the only female empress to be a co-ruler in the Mughal Empire, so 16th century India. She was quite amazing. She once shot four man-eating tigers with six musket shots from the top of an elephant. She led an army, also on top of an elephant, to rescue her husband who had been kidnapped by an opposing, uh, someone trying to take over the empire. And she led the army on an elephant and rescued him and brought him back. Um, and she was the only woman in Mughal India to issue coins, to issue executive orders. She was, for all intents and purposes, the emperor. She was amazing. Or there's Margaret Cavendish, who maybe some of you have heard, um, especially if you have a class with Connie Cassidy, you may have heard this episode because she used it um, in her class. Margaret Cavendish invented science fiction. And I know that you have been told that it was Mary Shelley that invented science fiction. I love Mary Shelley with my whole heart, but Margaret Cavendish was writing science fiction a hundred years before Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. She challenged the philosophies of the most famous minds of the 18th century. She was into fabulous cosplay. And she discovered the truth that the universe is infinite 200 years before anyone else would even talk about it. So she was a little amazing. Uh, Claudia Jones emigrated to the US um, from Trinidad to New York City when she was eight years old. She was, when she was in her 20s and 30s, she was arrested for giving speeches promoting peace activism and women's rights. Finally, to get rid of her because she was causing so much trouble, they deported her. They tried to deport her to Trinidad. Trinidad wouldn't take her because they were having such a massive civil rights and uh, labor union influx. They were like, absolutely not. We're not getting an established organizer. So they thought, all right, we'll get her out of the way. We'll send her to the UK. She can't cause any trouble there. So they deport her to England. She promptly opens the first black newspaper in England and becomes one of the most important civil rights activists. Uh, uh, civil rights activists and organizers in Europe. So the podcast is about these kind of remarkable women who have done incredible things but have been mostly erased from our history that we're not hearing about in high school, in college. They're not in magazines. We're not talking about them, even though they were absolutely amazing. Uh, so that's the subject of the podcast. But in recording it, we often find that we're having conversations that are helping us sort of evaluate and recognize our own lives and our own values and, and values in like a existential kind of way, right? Like what are the things that matter in life? And like lessons that have helped us to live our lives better. Oh, that's Katie. That's Katie. I mean, she's short on top. Um, so sometimes people think that we have like faked these discussions 
or that we're scripting them, and we're really, truly not. We, we're just nerdy enough to actually have these kinds of conversations all the time. So these are just the ones that happen to happen on, on camera. Um, so we do scaffold the framework for each episode, but we genuinely don't know what the other person is going to say. And usually when I, we record our episodes together on Skype or online, genuinely when I get online to record her episode, I usually have no idea who we're talking about at all. Um, and vice versa for her. So I'm going to share a few very short versions of some of these stories and a few audio clips showing what we do. But rather than try to cram these women's bios into like 30 second clips like I just did, that feels like erasing them again. Um, so I've pulled out some bits that I think might be helpful also in this idea of like making your own stuff. Because that's what I'm really passionate about, is helping you make your stuff. So um, whatever project you're doing, writing, everything is writing. Podcasting is writing. Art is writing, like all knowing how to organize and analyze and all the things that you're learning in English really do make up the bones of almost anything that you're going to do. So first, I'm going to tell you about this, one of our first episodes here, the Oracle of Delphi. Um, some of you probably know the, of the Oracle of Delphi, even if just from Percy Jackson. Um, but the real Oracle of Delphi is not a teenage girl or a mummy in the attic. Um, the site of Delphi has been a place where people talk to the gods for thousands of years. Uh, for a thousand years before the oracle arrived, people, this was seen as a, a place where the gods lived and where you could go and talk to them. Pythia, the oracle, was a random, elderly, uneducated nobody. Just this random peasant woman who wandered in to the temple or to the area 2,500 years ago and suddenly began speaking the voice of God. People would come, men would come from all over the ancient world, from everywhere, to come and ask her questions. You had to be very rich and very important and very male to come and ask her questions, but she was the most powerful woman in the world because she shaped the course of human events. Kings emperors were coming to say, should I go invade Thebes? Should I marry my cousin? Should I, all of these things that are going to change the world, she's the one informing those decisions. At a time and a place where, the, this is one of the most sexist and misogynistic places and times in human history, Greece at this period, and yet she is the one shaping this world. Um, so Katie was actually leading study abroad in Greece and visited Delphi and the, the temple there, the Temple of Apollo. And so for part of this episode, it's recorded on location and she walks us through what it would have been like to visit the Temple of Apollo and ask a question of the oracle. And the process was a little unusual. Let's visit the site. There's this large altar in front of the temple. It's so large it has its own steps. You might climb up the steps to the altar. And this is where you're going to leave your sacrifice. So as weird as it might 
seem to have the future of the human race riding on whether or not a goat was cold. That's how it was. Um, and then, well, so Katie was filming this episode and was just sort of walking through all of these places, and she um, is there with her husband Mark, who's a philosophy professor, so they lead the study abroad together. And they stumbled on this amazing man who is named Dimitrios Georgar Georgaris. I'm terrible at Greek, so I'm very sorry to anyone who knows Greek. Um, he is an artist who's been living in Delphi for 45 years and who moved there specifically to listen to the spirit of Delphi, which he believes is still there. So he goes to the museum every day and picks an artifact from ancient Delphi and just sits and listens for the spirit of Delphi. This sounds bananas. I get it. I know. And she told me about it. I said, this is bananas. And then she explained, I mean, this man seems really genuinely to have tapped into something. She said, I believe that he believes, at least, that he is hearing something there. Uh, and so, I'm going to have him, I'm going to play this clip that hopefully we'll be able to hear of him explaining a little of the spirit of Delphi and the spirit of this Pythia, who is still there, he believes. And this clip starts with a song, which is a little bit of a song, which is the oldest piece of written music in the world that we know of. It's the oldest recorded written melody, which is from the 1st or 2nd century AD in, in um, Delphi. And it was a poem that, that we've known about forever, but only in the, in the last century realized, wait a minute, what are those weird things about the words? Oh my gosh, that's music! And figured out that this is a melody written down. So this is a, an arrangement performance of that. And the words are shockingly modern to me. This sounds like it could have been written in Boulder this year, especially, especially at Europa, where I teach, could have been written this year, and yet it's 2,000 years old. Let's visit the site. So, we have to know ourselves, he says. That might sound familiar. Know thyself. This was the big piece of advice that was on the wall of the Oracle at Delphi 2,000 years ago, um, which then Socrates gets credit for. I thought Socrates made it up. He did not. He was quoting the Oracle at Delphi. But this is my super helpful advice to you. Know thyself. Yay. <laughs> Know your strengths. Yay! No one's ever told us that before. No, so here's what I mean by that. Your super specific, and yet maybe very, very vague strengths. So we talk about know your strengths, know yourself. I want to drill down to like the very core level, because this is what I never did, 
when I was an undergrad and I didn't figure out how to do until a few years ago and it was so important to helping me think through what I actually want to do in my life. I'm good at writing. No. What are you good at in writing? What is it that you are very good at about writing? I'm very good at telling stories. I am very good at humanizing research in writing. Right? These very specific subsets of writing that I'm very good at. And then other parts of writing that I'm not. I'm still really rubbish at grammar. And I teach writing. Like, I just, I don't, I can't care enough about it, right? Don't tell the school where I teach writing. I'm not telling you what school I teach writing in. But, like, that I'm, I'm really, really good at the storytelling part of writing. Um, Katie and I are both very good at translating academic material for a general audience. And I think a lot of that is because our family are all academics. Our parents are professors, our siblings are professors. We have one sibling who's not a professor, who's like just a linguistic anthropologist. <laughs> and, or, you know, on their way to becoming professors. Um, and so, and, and we have a huge wide, there's six kids in my family with a really wide base of knowledge. So we all grew up having to learn how to be excited about other people's stuff, right? And, and being curious and knowing just enough about something to be interested in the conversations. Um, this, this means that we're really good at that, at like, we know a little bit about everything. But also, it means that we refuse to put up with academic snobbery. I think people think that a family of academics is going to be like the height of academic snobbery. But when you grow up and the professor is your dad, who do you think you are? My dad. It's my dad. You're not God, right? But it's this that you have a totally healthy respect for academia, but it's not scary. And that it's not any better than anyone else's field and so we are willing to do that work there's so you know that the idea that you should you shouldn't be understandable to people not in the field nonsense if you can't explain at least the basics of your field to someone who doesn't know anything about it what are you even doing <laughs> so that's what we're really good at we're really good at that um, process of like turning really sort of hyper nerdy academic conversations into regular people conversations without even meaning to. And so that really helped us because our goal, since we decided to set our goals really low, we just decided to be everything to everyone and try to make this podcast <coughs> something that could be used in a college classroom and that your neighbor who never graduated from high school will enjoy. And it's been really, really exciting to see based on our reviews that we seem to be doing that, that everyone can access it and enjoy it, and it is also being used in college classrooms a lot, and high school classrooms, and some of them in middle school classrooms, which is exciting. And getting these very underrepresented categories of women back into the curriculum. This also means that we have a really wide network, right, of academics, that we, we have, if there's any question about anything, we probably are related to someone who knows the answer, or at least are related to someone who knows who knows the answer, right? That we have family, like the first three kids in my family all did arts and humanities, and the, the second three did sciences. And so we kind of cover everything except math, I guess. But I married math, so it's okay. Um, also, know your requirements. I'm saying requirements, not weaknesses. Because I think framing things as weaknesses can make us quit on stuff that doesn't need to be quit. So I'm really, really not good at interviewing people. And I do an interview podcast. That's a bad idea. But because Katie is really good at interviewing people, she really wanted to do that. And it's a great idea. And that just means that I have to make sure the format is really edited that because I'm very good at storytelling, I can take a really messy, confusing interview and turn it into something that makes sense and is coherent. I, I, I have ADHD and my interviews are all over the place, and down the rabbit hole, and that thing you said back then was interesting, and let's talk about this. But I can put it all together into something that sounds like I knew what I was doing. 
And so the format that we chose makes what could have been a weakness into a strength, because I can get all kinds of weird material that people wouldn't have gotten in an interview that is straightforward. Um, guests are always like, wow, no one's ever asked me that before. Yes, great. Also, I should ask you about the main subject we're talking about. But like, the, I get a lot of good stuff because I've figured out how to access, turn my what might be a weakness into just a different way of doing it. Um, also, know what you want. And again, yes, <laughs> just know what you want and do it. I mean that very, 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 very specifically. For a lot of years, I had this very weird thing where I knew I was a very good teacher, and I knew that I really, really liked teaching, and yet I had this very strange pushback against the idea of teaching for my career. And I could not figure out what was going on. I couldn't figure out why. I felt so uncomfortable with this. And I had been teaching, and I still just, something felt off about it. Um, and I finally uh, worked through this great book that I recommend called Designing Your Life um, that forces you to really dig in and figure out what it is about what you're doing that you love or that, you, I hate my job, what do you hate about your job? I love my job, what do you love about your job? At the granular level, and I finally had to just sort of break down and admit that I really, like, I love a lot of things about teaching, but what I really, really love about teaching is I really like attention. <laughs> and I really like standing in front of people and talking. And that should be a plus for teaching, right? But the kind of teaching that I mostly do, and the types of women's studies classes especially that I'm teaching, um, I, for me, I believe that that kind of performative teaching is exactly the wrong way to teach those classes. That if you're the center of that classroom, you're doing it wrong. That doesn't apply to all teaching, but for what I am doing specifically, it's doing it wrong. And I think that dissonance in my head of like, I really enjoyed it and I know it's wrong. It made it feel like I, I, it's bad what I'm doing or something. But once I finally recognize, okay, I, I mean, I like attention. This is not shocking to anyone who knows me, people who know me in the back. I was a theater kid. Of course I like performing, right? Of course I do. And as soon as I could separate those out and say, this is what I really like, but I also really love transforming students' lives and opening, watching the moment. You can see the moment when they go, oh, and it clicks, and, they, and helping them achieve the lives they want instead of the lives that society has told them they can have. I love that. And I can do that without doing this. I just have to get my performance fixed somewhere else. Like a podcast. And deciding all those things, figuring out all those things, um, was really critical to letting me do what I do because I had bought into the rhetoric that like attention seeking is bad. And I don't buy that, by the way. I think attention seeking is value neutral. and can be used for good or for evil. But that I can get the things that I want in my life from different pieces of my career. I don't have to get it all in one piece. And I can teach the way that I believe is right and still get to perform and show off other places. So just figuring those things out, really, about yourself and owning, owning it instead of like trying to pretend that, that no, I, I love teaching because of this. I don't like attention at all. Of course I like attention. Um, so it completely really changed things for me and it helped me build the life that I want. Uh, so um, this is Emily de Chatelet. She is unbelievable. She's so amazing. I love this woman. She was, is one of the most important minds of the 18th century, of the Enlightenment and the Age of Reason. You know, you hear about all these people who transformed the entire world in the way everyone thinks, Voltaire and all of these amazing people. She was as important and as influential and right in the middle of all of it with all of them. And I bet you've never heard of her, right? Has anyone in this room heard of her? One. She was unbelievable. She she was the first person to translate <coughs> Newton from Latin. So that all of Europe had, could understand Newton and physics and science and all of these things because of her. And she would do it on the fly, like just translating moments 
crazy complex math that people still can't understand, and she's just sort of doing it. Um, she came up with some of the most important scientific discoveries of her time. She discovered, she theorized about the existence of infrared light, like a hundred years before another woman that we talked about in the podcast would go on to actually prove that she was right. Um, but she, and she was one of the most mathematical, the, the most important mathematical geniuses of her time, and yet she's completely erased. She, her life is hilarious. She was the daughter of the chief of etiquette at the court at Versailles. So if you know about Versailles at all, this is probably the most stodgy, <coughs> mannered rules, you stay in your box, you do what you're supposed to do, times in human history. And her dad is literally the chief of etiquette. He's the boss of manners. And she broke out of all of that in a time when women aren't supposed to do anything and sort of pioneered like living her best life. She was like an Instagram influencer, only the best kind, and did her life the way she wanted. Uh, her dad gave her a thorough education. This is a time when even like the princesses don't know how to write their name, and she has a complete thorough education, which was, people thought that that was ridiculous. He may have lived to regret that decision, although he seems to have been pretty supportive of her. When she turned 16 and suddenly became really startlingly beautiful, all of these suitors come calling, of course, right? She's this very <coughs> high-born, beautiful girl. And she knows that as soon as she gets married, she doesn't get to do books anymore, she doesn't get to do math anymore, she doesn't get to do any of the things that she loves anymore. She also knows that she doesn't get to say no. If someone comes and asks for her hand, her parents get to choose, and she doesn't get to say no. She has a plan. She had to find some way of delaying marriage just a little bit longer. Just buy yourself some time. So she did what any sensible young woman would do. <laughs> she challenged the chief of the royal guard to a duel. <laughs> and she followed through. She did it. They had the duel. <laughs> In front of the whole court, she, she had to take off her formal dress. She gets out her sword and she goes wild. What? She's all fierce and passionate and kind of terrifying. <laughs> she didn't win, but she didn't lose. And they called a draw. And wow. they're all like exhausted and panting and the duel is over. And even though she didn't win the duel, her main goal was accomplished. Who wants a yeah. wild woman who duels with the men? <laughs> the fawning crowds were gone. So, she needs some way to get money without seeming like she's trying to get money. She had to find some way. Okay. So, yay! If you duel with the men in, in your underwear with a sword, nobody wants to marry you anymore! But now, her mom is so angry at her for doing this that she cuts her off. She's like, no more money for books. No, nothing. No more money for you for books. And she can't live without books. So, now what is she going to do? But she had a plan for that, too. Fawning crowds were gone. So, she needs some way to get money without seeming like she's trying to get money. <laughs> Luckily, she's very well educated while most women around her aren't. Right. And she's got a very good mind for numbers. Mm. And if there's one thing all these courtly folks love, it's card games. <gasps> so, see where I'm going here? Does she become a card show? Yes. Ah! She, she figures out how to count the cards. <laughs> <laughs> and she keeps winning and winning at the oh, card tables. I love her so much. I know. Huge <clears throat> sums of money. Wow. Books. <laughs> and this is, of course, the perfect cover because nobody's going to believe that a girl is counting <coughs> cards, right? Girls can't do math. And so she totally gets away with it. And she, like, enormous amounts of money from everyone at court. And she just has this reputation. He is the lucky 
luckiest card player you've ever seen in your life. Um, because nobody expects her to be able to weaponize these skills that she has. Um, so I think we've established her cred as an out-of-the-box thinker. But she really did craft her life into exactly what she wanted in a time that was impossible. She finds a way to marry a man who is fond of her but doesn't really care what she does. And then she can go off with all of the men that she's interested in. These, she's lived with Voltaire for 15 years in this tumble-down chateau in the middle of, middle of nowhere where no one would ever want to live. Which is, of course, now like prime south of France. Perfect, right? But it was, who would want to be there? And they just do science all day for 15 years. She completely creates this perfect life for herself. And granted, she also had like a super rich husband and a very fancy title and one of the best brains of her century. So like, they might not exactly correlate to our lives, right? But I think her view on life is really amazing that we can just pick the life we want and try to build it, at least. It's, it doesn't always work out for her, but you can at least try to make your life into something that looks like what you're interested in. Um, we have to see it that way. Um, I love this quote from her, let us choose for ourselves our path in life and let us try to strew that path with flowers. Mm -hmm. Choose it and then just do what you can to make it better. It's not going to be perfect, but there's stuff you can probably do to make it better. And while you keep looking for something better around the corner, we have so many paths to happiness. In this okay. Oh, I ruined my chill. <laughs> All right. You didn't see that. Never mind. Next, I want you to think about the most famous magician in the world. Okay, you're all thinking of a name. Most famous magician in history. Ready? Let's all say the name together. One, two, three. Ah, oh, what? No, Adelaide Herman. <laughs> Who's this Houdini guy? So actually, Adelaide Herman, the queen of magic, she was friends with Houdini. She's performing at the same time that he was. And she was wildly more famous than Houdini ever was when they were alive. A lot of Houdini's fame is post-mortem, um, and that's largely due to his wife, um, who we talked about in one of our, in our Halloween episodes, if we have any Houdini fans who want to hear that, but she was a much, much bigger deal than Houdini was at the time. Um, and her husband, Alexander Herman, the great Herman, was actually the model on which, like picture a magician, right? The thing that you're probably thinking of is the top hat and the cape, and maybe a cane and like a pointy mustache and all of that. That's Alexander Herman. The idea of what a magician looks like, like if you have a cartoon magician, that's him. Um, and he was her husband. He, um, this was the, one of the very first interviews I did. I think this was the second interview I ever did. The audio isn't great, but it's still one of my favorite episodes. Our guest was Paul Draper, who is a magician and mentalist who you may have seen on TV. He's on TV a lot. He headlines in Vegas. He's, He's on everything all the time. Um, and he was really super excited to talk about Adelaide because he's been trying to get her story out there forever. It makes him really, really angry that she isn't more well known than she is. So she uh, married Alexander Herman. And when he had a heart attack, all of a sudden, at the peak of his career and died, she decided that she was going to take on his show herself. And she had been his assistant. But now she's going to try to be the magician. She knows that she's not going to be taken seriously. She's a woman. She's a former assistant. If she really wants to be successful in this, she's going to have to prove to everyone that she really is as good as her husband was. So the very first show she stages, she is performing a trick that she had spent most of her life trying to convince her husband not to do. Yeah, I've read about that, that she begs him to stop, and then he does Immediately does it in one month. Uh, what a sensation of peace. I mean, Kevin Teller performed this twice nightly in Vegas right now, but they are pointing the guns at each other, and they both attached one bullet. Reportedly, Adelaide Herman had six 
police militia men in whatever town she went to take up rifles and what matter. Many magicians would die performing this actually yeah, quite it's dangerous, dangerous legitimately yeah. dangerous illusion. And now we're really cynical about sage magic and we just kind of assume that everything that's happening up there is a fake. Not just a trick, but it's a <coughs> fake. And so we're not concerned, right? We're never concerned that he's actually going to die when he buries himself alive. Yeah. There are different ways to do the bullet catch, but all of them are life-threatening. And she not only does it, she catches six bullets on stage. And I know the secrets of how you do the bullet catch. So, if you want to know them, you can come and ask me. I know some of them. I don't know how many of them. Um, but they all, you, like, you can die she knows doing that. all of them. She's she was famous for this act. Electrocution! Very modern. Electricity is pretty new. Scary. Um, if anyone's seen Prestige, it's drawing a lot on what she did. Uh, these very modern, big, scary-looking machines. She had, she was famous for this act, um, Noah's Ark, where she had two of, like, hundreds of live animals, two of all these animals, including two live lions and live tigers, on stage, and then she would disappear them all on stage. The lions and tigers were dogs in costumes, but yeah. <laughs> lighting was different. And, um, she also debunked a bunch of mediums. This is the height of spiritualism, and they're doing seances, and there's all of these people out there um, convincing people that they can actually speak to the dead. And she was really adamant that using magic to actually trick people was wrong. And she would go through, as she was a master of escapology, and she would go and visit these mediums, figure out how they were doing it, and debunk them. Um, as because she really believed like this is wrong, we should not be tricking people with this. This is for entertainment, and we shouldn't be making money lying to people like that. Um, she, but none of this was in her plan, right? None of this was something that she planned to do with her life. She wanted to be a dancer. She didn't want to be a magician. She just married a magician. But she went on when life threw this change at her, and I have a clip, but it's, I'm going to run out of time. Um, well, I threw this change at her, and she just went, all right, fine, I'm going to do it, and if I'm going to do it, I'm going to have to be really good, because I'm a girl, and they're not going to believe that I can do it. So I'm going to do the bullet catch with six bullets, and I'm going to make the best show ever, and, but she also didn't say, fine, I'm going to be another Herman brother, right? There was Alexander Herman, and he had a brother who would perform in Europe. She could have said, I am another Herman brother, and dressed as a man and done his act. And she didn't. She made her own act. And she invented a totally new type of magic. A lot of people still doing tricks she invented now. And she danced in her own show. She turned it into this beautiful art form that was magic and dance and art and spectacular entertainment and made her own thing. So she didn't just take the thing that was thrown at her, she waited and she caught the wave at the right moment. And I, I think so much of life is just waiting for the right wave and being aware of the waves that are coming and going and grabbing it at the right minute. Um, that, that you just have to end up knowing when you're ready to grab and go. So that seems easy, right? But first you have to do the work. You have to do the work ahead of time before the thing comes that you want to do. Great, how do you know how to do that? How do you, how do you prepare for a thing that doesn't exist or that you don't know you want yet? This is where English is the best choice. English, they're, they're, I really cannot think of one field that English does not help you prepare for because the things that you're going to learn, first of all, critical thinking, how to think through problems, how to think around corners, how to um, evaluate information that's coming in, gives you a huge advantage academically, but also just in life. Like, like we were sort of talking, like reading job listings. You all know how to read between the lines of what this job really is and go, no, nope, not that one. No, no, nope, I'm not going to do Oh, an assistant, that means, all right, so I'm going to be bringing people coffee for minimum wage for seven years, right? Like, you can see what it really means in ways that it's hard for other people. Also, 
you know, reading, writing, all of those things that are important for the field, but as someone who worked for many years helping people write application essays for grad school and for law school and for scholarships, there are so many terrible writers out there. So terrible! And if you know how to write well, for any job you're applying to, you know how to write a better cover letter. You know how to write a better resume. You know how to get your story in there. And in an interview, you know how to tell your stuff better because of the training that you get here. It makes a huge, huge, huge difference. Um, but then you can also, very specific things you can start doing. You, you might not know what you want, but you know the general area that you're interested in, usually, right? I like writing, I like doing this, I like performing, I like science, I like... And you can start to think about possibilities that might happen there. You can start to build your network. And not in the, like, gross business major -y kind of, you know, networking. Like, you know people who do stuff. And especially in the English department, you know people who are doing creative things or want to do creative things. Start thinking about your skills and other people's skills, your friends' skills, your family members' skills, your roommates' skills, people, things that might complement one another that you can help boost each other. Um, the song that you heard at the beginning of that clip I played earlier is performed and arranged by my brother, who is a musician. We knew going in that because our parents are musicians and our whole family are musicians, we knew that music was something going to be really important to our podcast, but also something that we could do easily and immediately to improve the quality and make us stand out because we have a huge network of musicians from our family members to Katie's, you know, Katie's husband to my husband to our children to our kids fiddle teachers like we have all of these people that we can ask to help us do music and that also help boost their careers too right because you have to make sure you're not just taking stuff from people. I think you've all probably in here already had the experience of how many people think writing is easier and they're like, will you help me write this? No, I will not. That's seven hours of work, right? But that you can help boost each other um, and help get each other's things out there. You know, this song that we put on here, he let us use, it's perfect for the episode. Also now 3,000 people have heard this song and we can help each other. Um, fail quickly. Jump in, mess around, figure stuff out. Don't be afraid to mess around. Like the first thing that I tell people in my class, like, you know, if, if you learn one thing in this class, but I really mean it, like be wrong in public. Learn to be wrong in public, but also learn to be wrong in public for as short a period of time as possible, right? Be wrong and then learn the thing and do better. And that applies to everything from like the way you treat other people to how you do a podcast. You just have to start doing it. And if you're so worried about, I don't know how to do this yet, you're never going to start. But also, don't post your first podcast episode 45 seconds after you record it, right? Take a moment to flail around in private and figure it out. We took six months from the moment we went, I think podcasting is the thing, to learn how to podcast and get a few episodes in the box and finished before we put anything out there because we saw how many podcasters get five episodes in and then go, oh, that's what we're doing, and figure out their format. <coughs> we wanted to do that in private, and we did. We reformatted over, we're like, oh, we should put this in. Oh, we got to do this. And by the time we were ready to put things out in the world, we had already made a lot of mistakes that no one knew about. Um, so that balance is important, but it's actually pretty simple to figure out for yourself, like where, where you're comfortable being wrong in public and where you want to wait a little bit longer. But don't wait too long. Um, advocate for yourself and for new stuff. Go bug the department to give you more training and stuff. Have podcasting workshops. Have the, I'm so impressed with the intern program here and the whole idea that you're getting professionalization training. That's amazing. I had nothing like that as an undergrad. It, like, it would have made my life so much easier to learn how to do those things. Jump on those opportunities and then ask for more. If there's something that you want to learn how to do, everything is writing, right? Film, film, filmmaking is writing. Podcasting is writing. All of, music is writing. All of this is writing. So push for the kinds of um, cross-pollination events that you want. Go 
take classes in other departments and figure out what you're interested in and where you can find your niche. One of the most effective scholars in my program um, when I was here is doing unbelievable work at the intersection of science and English because so few people have the training in both of those things and he's making just truly groundbreaking discoveries in literature that people have been studying for 200 years because he understands chemistry. And, and like no one has noticed, you know this is a chemistry thing, right? What? It's unbelievable. So find where your intersections lie and the things that you're good at that other people don't have. You might think you don't have any. You have something that nobody else has. You know about that thing. I don't care if it's tiny. I don't care if it's like I lived in this place or I understand this thing or I had this experience once. That is valuable and you can leverage that toward finding your own thing and your own box. Next, catch the thing that's coming. Just wait and watch for it and be aware. Um, one of the reasons that we did a podcast when we didn't know how to do a podcast is because we, we joked for a long time, and you've probably heard this from other people, you don't have to be good at something, you just have to be first. Now I would argue you do have to be good eventually, but if you're first, you have a huge advantage, right? When blogging became a thing, when I was in an under, when I was an undergrad high school, um, there were a few bloggers who just started and didn't quit, and became huge. And some of them are brilliant writers, and some of them are fine, but they're famous because they were first, right? And so you don't have to be first at everything, right? Oh, I missed it, but catch the thing early on if you can, because you have a huge advantage. And we saw at that moment, you know what? Podcasts, that's the thing. It was right at the moment, it's amazing how fast it's gone, when it was going from, do you know what a podcast is? To, do you listen to podcasts? And we realized that, that like, we have six months before this becomes a really huge thing. And we better figure it out if we're gonna do it. And we did catch it, like, right at the moment when podcasts became a thing that your parents know about too, and and we were able to leverage that in really good ways. There's still lots of podcasts starting now that are doing amazing things, but it was easier for us because we were at the beginning. So pay attention, watch for those waves, see what's coming, and go, huh, maybe that's something, and I'm not at that one. Maybe that's something I'm interested in, and just mess around and see if you can figure out something that you like. And don't forget, you can ride several waves at once. You don't just have to have the one. Um, you may have heard of Tim Minchin, he's a really famous Australian comedian who is not very famous here, but he's hilarious and you should look him up. And he gave a really fantastic graduation speech, which I usually hate graduation speeches, but his is gold. And one of the things he says in it is that instead of the idea of like plan your life, you should have the passionate pursuit of short-term goals while always looking for the shiny thing. And I love that. I try to plan, plan my life in like five-year chunks, but always watching for the shiny thing. Because you can't plan your life. I don't know a single person who like graduated from college and went, here's my plan, and got that life. I really don't. Almost everyone I know got a much better life than the one they would have planned for, because you think you have to plan reasonably. Stop planning reasonably. Be ridiculous. We planned for, you know, we're going to start a women's history podcast. We have never done audio editing in our lives, and we have no idea what we're doing, but it's going to be great. And now we have 100,000 people listening to us. That's bananas. We wouldn't have done that, and we couldn't have planned 10 years ago, you know what we should do is start a podcast, because it didn't exist. The thing that you're going to do might not even exist yet. So all you can do is watch for it. Um, this is... Mary Lemmon's Titcom, she invented the bookmobile. She is one of my personal heroes as a former librarian. She became a librarian in like the first year that you could be a librarian. It was a brand new job, and her options were teacher, nurse, librarian. She went, yes, I love to read, librarian. So she, we, now we have 10,000 job options, and I think it's the paralysis of options, right? Like I was like, oh my gosh, there's so many things, and uh, how do I know what I want? Well, you're never going to pick the perfect job. You're not going to find your perfect job. I'm here to tell you now, there is a job that is perfect for you, and you're never going to find it. Fine. Find one that's better, right? 
find at least something that's better. And at least you have enough options that you don't have to decide between teacher or nurse. If you want to be a teacher or a nurse, you can. And you can also be anything else. So just pick something. And I think this is where you all have a really good advantage over some of us who are older because we have ruined everything for you to the point where <laughs> you know you're not going to have one job for the rest of your life, right? That's not, I mean, my parents were like aspiring to that, and for us, you didn't aspire to it, but it was probably what was going to happen. You all know that's never going to happen. You're not going to have one job for the rest of your life. You're not going to have one job at a time, right? The gig economy means you're going to have three jobs at a time. That's horrible, and I am so sorry that we did that to you. But it also means that you have a lot more options and flexibility, that you can look ahead and go, you know what, fine, I'll do this for six months, but maybe that thing. And you can have several different things going at once. If you start this and you don't like it, and you drop it and you start that, you are so much more willing and able to just catch waves as they come and do several things at once in ways that's terrifying to your parents. Um, as I'm sure you have noticed when they're like, what do you want? You have to have a job. Well, you only have four. But you can build your career, right? <coughs> that you can pick the things that you like. Oh, here's the, I love this. So she custom built this wagon with bookshelves. And she brought books to people who would, are never going to have a book in their life, would never have seen a book in the middle of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Because she didn't see her job as being a librarian in a library. Her job was getting books to people. And that's the last final thing that I really want to talk about. I think it's the most important thing. Think about what you want to do. Don't think about what you want to be. Think about what you want to do. Because nobody careers. You don't lawyer, right? You don't journalist. You don't politician. You do something. So in the same way that, like, drill down on the things that you love, drill down on what it is you want to do. I want to teach. Cool. What about teaching do you love? And what are all the different ways that you can get that fixed, right? What do you want to specifically, microgranular level, do? Um, when I was an undergrad, I spent a year as an archaeology major. I desperately wanted to be an Egyptologist. I've been obsessed with Egypt since I was seven. This is going to be the best month ever. I am so excited. And I did a full year before somebody finally took me aside and went, so remember that part where you're super claustrophobic and you can't breathe when you are in, say, tunnels or underground? And remember how most of this job is done in tunnels underground? I am not going to lie, I was really crushed. And, I mean, like that I hadn't thought about that. It was ridiculous, right? <laughs> Denial will do a lot. But I, I was really upset and I realized I really genuinely can't do this job. I'm not going to be able to do this job that I love and that I really want to do. But when I actually was forced to sit down and think through what is it that I love about this job, here's what I love about Egyptology. The mystery of it, the discovery of new things, the excitement, the travel, the storytelling, the bringing forgotten history to life, and then sharing that with the world. Does this all sound familiar? All of those things that I can get. I want to examine the human condition. I can do that in a million other places, right? And though I would still love to be in Egypt doing that, I can get all of that. And I've done that in my career as a travel writer, as a podcaster, as a teacher, as a writer. Like all of these things I've been able to assemble in different seasons and different ways in my life. And I just really had to readjust the way that I analyzed my life from what I want to be to what I want to do. So, so what do you want to do? And then start looking at all the ways that you can do that thing. So, I know that lots of you are hearing lots of negatives about creative work in the world, or English majors, or anything other than STEM or business majors, right? Especially now and especially in the precarious position and with parents who are terrified because they're watching your student loans rise. All of that is valid, but there are great things about doing podcasts 
for example, and weird, made up, brand new jobs. For example, books. Those are free books that people have sent me. And it's really nice to be in a room where people will actually appreciate it. But that's awesome. <laughs> that's like this year of free books. I would do so much more than make a podcast with that many free books, frankly. And they're great books. And they just mail them to me. Um, they, we have agents sending us books and publishers calling us and saying, we would like you to interview this famous author whose books you admire. And I was like, okay, sure. That's fine, I guess. I'll totally be professional and not freak out a little bit at all. Um, we are turning people away, like I said. We're trending. We're in the top 1,000. But look, something that I made is trending next to NPR shows. My name is on a thing next to Dana Tennant. My kids finally think I'm cool. No, they don't. But they almost think I'm cool. If I'm above David Tennant instead of below David Tennant, then they might think I'm cool. I think I'm cool. Um, I get to do work that helps people that I really love. So some of you may recognize shows that Laura, you may even have a class with her if you're super lucky. She's a PhD candidate here. Um, she is she studies the beat women poets. And I was able to do an episode on Carolyn Cassidy, who's an amazing woman who, if you have heard of her at all, you've heard of her as Neil Cassidy's wife, or that lady who slept with Jack Kerouac. Um, <laughs> And I was able to do an amazing episode on her with her daughter, Kathy Cassidy, and with Josette Lord, who wrote her master's thesis on Carolyn Cassidy. So I was able to access her amazing knowledge, but also let her talk to Kathy Cassidy and make her whole day that you don't get to talk to the children of the people that you wrote your 60-page thing on, but she did. So you can take, like, you can, again, those networks and help people. You could talk to amazing, amazing people. This is Debbie Lozer. She's a Guggenheim winner. She's awesome. That's her holding trading cards that I made. Um, Keith O'Brien, New York Times number one bestseller author, called me, asked if he could be on my show. Like, all of these people are just amazing. And they want to talk to me. It's so cool, though. Also, this is Kara Cooney. Maybe none of you know her, but you should gasp audibly. <laughs> because she's an amazingly brilliant Egyptologist and author of books on Egyptology and my personal Egyptology hero, and I got to talk to her last month. And so your dream might not always come true, but you do get to do your dream job in weird ways sometimes and talk Egyptology with the person that you can barely keep it together and be a professional on the phone with. We make multiple dollars an hour, <laughs> which it's ridiculous, but also, I, w I was embarrassed. I, last year I made $2.35 an hour. Part of that is because I was very slow at the beginning, because I didn't actually take classes, I just taught myself, which is a terrible idea. Please take classes in the things that you want to learn, but also get in and mess around. Um, but So I was like, oh, that's embarrassing. And my husband, the business guy, was like, are you kidding? You're a startup entrepreneur business that made money your first year? No one makes money for four years. You made hundreds of dollars your first year. So that was a good ego boost for me. I was like, oh yeah, hey, we made money. But it's not my whole career, right? Obviously, I could not survive on $2.30 an hour. But I also teach, I also write. I've built a career out of all of the pieces of these things. And everything together is giving me the career that I want. Um, Really nice people say really nice things about me, like award-winning filmmakers and award-winning everybody's. And Melinda Gates is telling people to listen to my podcast, y'all. What? How did that happen? Um, websites are putting us on lists of things, and this just happened. Westminster Abbey is using our podcast in their programming and inviting us in to do free tours. Which is great if I hadn't just been to Westminster Abbey three weeks ago and waited two hours in line and paid eighty dollars. But still, very exciting. Like th this is nerd heaven for me. This is ridiculous. Like, it's, what do you say? Is I'm going to get on NPR and then everything will be perfect. 
but you can build your career out of pieces. I have all of these pieces that give me the career that I want. You don't have to have one job. You don't have to pick a thing. Pick a lot of things and find the thread. The thread for me that connects these things is women's stories, women's history, empowering women, um, connecting different cultures and ideas, and performing and getting attention. And I can build the things that I want slowly, and I teach some things that I don't love teaching too, because money is a thing in this world, but you can make your life more like what you want it to be if you can pay attention to the things that you actually like about what you like. So, two years ago when I walked past that gravestone, that could have just been a moment of like, women are a race, it sucks, I hate it. But because I had done all of the work and been watching for the thing, that moment turned into this whole project and this whole career that I, I definitely couldn't, I didn't know what a podcast was six months before that moment, right? I couldn't have planned for that. All I could do was prepare for whatever the thing was. And, you know, not to beat the dead horse, but English really does that. Like, I would not have been ready for that if I hadn't had the training that I had in English and critical thinking and, and in women's studies, for women's studies, to get your brain to a place where it can do that work, where it can pay attention to these things. Um, and so, from like that moment there, I have 100,000 people listening to me tell them about the most famous madam in Purple Creek, Colorado. That is not a life trajectory that I expected, but it's awesome, and we get to give women back their names. And for me, that's the point. So it's, it's something that I feel really lucky to do, and really glad that I get to do. I have no idea how to 